I imagine that you're all here because you have either suffered a, a you know, catastrophic loss or you, or you know someone who has. Um, and so, so thank you for, for making the choice to, um, to engage with the grief. Um, so I'll, I'll tell a little bit about my story and then, and then some of the, the tools that I sort of just found that helped me uh, in my grieving process. Um, and then we can open up to, to questions afterwards. Um, but, uh, but as Fiona mentioned, I, I was, we were driving out to Joshua Tree, uh, the four of us, my wife, Gail, my daughter, 17 year old daughter, Ruby and 14 year old son, Hart, they were in the back seat. And we were, we were struck, we were T-boned by a drunk and high driver going 40 miles above the speed limit, the freeway speed limit. Um, and she never touched the brakes. She was too high uh, to even touch the brakes. So, um, so we were hit at 90 miles an hour and, uh, and seatbelts don't help you in the back seat if you are T-boned. Uh, and Hart and Ruby were killed. Uh, and it was such a shock. It was such a um, inconceivable shock because I, I never even thought of the possibility of losing both my children. It never even entered my mind. Uh, and here I was struck with this reality. And I, I say that I, I come from a, a family that's grief averse. That's how I describe us. Uh, we just don't really talk about grief in my family. We're very waspish, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. I don't want to be uh, generalizing. But um, we, we, uh, we don't really talk about uh, grief and grieving in my family. And suddenly, with Ruby and Hart killed, I knew I, I had to. I knew I suddenly I had to grieve. I couldn't just move on, right? Um, and my wife is Jewish, and we raised Ruby and Hart as Jews. They were bar and bat mitzvahed. For those of you who don't know, it's the, the um, ritual that you, that you do when you become a, an adult in the Jewish community when you're 13 years old. Um, and it's a lengthy process, and they both did it, and it was very meaningful to them. And we were an active member of our, of our temple um, out here in California. Uh, oh, and by the way, I, I grew up in New Jersey, so I'm, I'm a Jersey boy. Uh, I grew up in Haddonfield, New Jersey, so uh, so I'm glad to be speaking with with the library in New Jersey. It means a lot to me. But um, uh, we were active members of our temple out here in, in Los Angeles and called ICAR, and I decided that I would just follow whatever the Jews told me to do, basically. So whatever my rabbi said to do, I was going to do. Um, and I discovered that uh, that these rituals, these ancient rituals, they have so many sort of rules, um, prescribed patterns, I found it to be uh, amazingly educational for me in terms of how to grieve. I, I literally learned how to grieve my children through these rituals. Uh, and so, uh, for example, one of the early rituals is, is sitting Shiva. And for those of you who don't know, in the Jewish tradition, for the first seven nights after the funeral, uh, your community comes with to your house and sits literally sits with you in your grief. And at first, I thought this is a terrible idea. Uh, it's the last thing I want to do is is have people come into my house. I, I you know I, I I'm out of my mind with grief. Um, but I just said, okay, what well, that's what we're going to do because that's what the rabbi says to do. And each night, they 150 people poured into our home, right when I wanted to cocoon into a ball and be alone. But then our wise rabbi, Sharon Browse, she had said some prayers and then turned to us and said, Gail and Colin, do you want to say anything to the people gathered here? And I discovered that I did. I desperately wanted to talk uh, about my grief and grieving and about Ruby and Hart. And I found it was so useful because all day long I was in this stew uh, of just, you know, confusion and grief. Uh, and I didn't know what was happening to me. And here was an opportunity to talk about it to somebody. And so each night I had something different to say about my grief in that moment because it's constantly changing. And I also so valued talking about Ruby and Hart. And so did my community. So, so Gail and I would tell stories about Ruby and Hart, sad and funny ones. So we'd laugh and cry. And then we'd invite our friends and Ruby and Hart's friends to come forward and tell their stories about Ruby and Hart. And they all did. And it was such a powerful a beautiful, uh, tragic, but beautiful moment. Um, and so each night 
I started looking forward to the chance to talk about grief and talk about Ruby and Hart. Um, and then Shiva ended and everything changed because Shiva has a structure. And so people were very comfortable talking about Ruby and Hart and grief. But once Shiva was over, I noticed a change come about people. They would come to our house and we have a, we have a, a little gate in our front. So they would come through the door and they'd be ashen and terrified the same people who were telling Ruby and Hart stories just the other night, now they're coming in without these rules and structure, and they don't know what to say. And they're terrified of mentioning Ruby and Hart's names. They're terrified to ask me how I'm doing because they're afraid that they're going to cause me more pain. And so they wouldn't say anything. And I realized very quickly that this was not going to work. <laughs> like If I want to have meaningful conversations with people, I'm going to have to tell them some ground rules. And so Gail and I, my wife, we developed what I call our grief spiel. Uh, and spiel is, is, a, is a Yiddish term uh, that means like, a, like an argument, like a persuasive argument. But it has a sense of play to it because spiel it comes from German. Uh, Yiddish and German are very connected. And spiel means play in German. So it's kind of a playful you know, monologue that you're delivering, basically. It's a spiel. And I, I love that that interjection of playfulness in the midst of grief. <laughs> but, um, but my spiel was, I'd pull people aside one at a time and I'd say, look, here's the deal. I need to talk about Ruby and Hart. I need to talk about my grief. I need you to talk about Ruby and Hart <laughs> and your memories. I need to hear stories about Ruby and Hart from you. And it was so helpful to my friends to be told some ground rules because we don't know in a society, right? We don't know how do we talk to the grieving. And I think it, it, it made a lot of sense that people were scared to talk to us. Um, and it was really helpful to tell them, actually, it's okay to talk about Ruby and Hart. And in fact, I need it. I need to hear their names, even though it might cause me pain. And what I love about the grief spiel as a concept for grievers everywhere is that the griever creates it. So it's whatever you need. <laughs> you have to share your needs to your people and it can change. And it did. So for example, an early part of my grief spiel I found that people would compare my loss, um, uh, so the, the, would compare their loss to mine. So they would try and relate to me by saying like, oh, my cousin died 10 years ago, so I know how you feel. Um, or um, uh, my, my, my grandmother died uh, last year, so I, I can relate to your loss. And at the time, I really did not want to hear about other people's grief, right? I was in acute grief. I didn't have the bandwidth to hear their loss. And also it felt really kind of offensive. Like your cousin died 10 years ago. My kids, my children died two days ago. Like, what are you doing? And I, I understand that they were just trying to relate, which trying to be positive, but it was, it felt bad. And so I put it in my grief spiel uh, and I made it a little comedic because I, you know, I, I appreciate humor. So I actually said, and forgive my foul language, but I said, uh, as part of my spiel, I said, also, I don't give a shit about your dad who died 10 years ago, or your dead cousin, or your dead grandma, or your dead favorite cat, uh, which got, got a laugh from people, um, my bluntness, but it also did the trick. And people didn't, people stopped sharing their losses, and they just listened to my loss. Um, and now, now I feel very different. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk uh, to other people about their losses, right? Um, I, I have the bandwidth to, and I want to talk about their cousin who died 10 years ago, absolutely, and their grief. But in acute grief, I, I didn't have the bandwidth. Um, and so that helped. And another, another change that happened in my grief spiel was I noticed that people would try and be upbeat around me, and then they would sort of slink away to the bathroom and then weep. And I was like, wait, what do you do? I can hear you. <laughs> I can hear you crying. Why are you hiding? and crying in the bathroom. And it was because they were scared that if they cried in front of me, I might start crying. And that felt bad to them. It felt hurtful. Like I was, they were hurting me by making, making me cry, making me remind my, remind me of the, of the pain I was in. And so I told people, actually, I, I like crying. Uh, I, I kind of need to cry. If I don't cry for a day or two, I start to feel sick inside. And this is again, an early acute grief. Um, and so I told people I have a very different relationship to crying and I, I, I want to see you cry. It actually helps me because I don't feel quite so alone. 
Like I want the whole world to weep over Ruby and Hart. And so that helped in a, in a, in a big way. Um, in fact, I, I had a friend um, who was so, so close to Ruby and Hart that she, she couldn't even handle talking in a normal voice to me. She had to talk in a super high pitched, like really happy voice, like, hi, how are you? So good to see you. And it was really grating. It was like, this is a house of mourning. What are you doing? And I said to her, look, I, you know, I love you. You're so wonderful and, and upbeat, but, but it's hard for me to, to hear that right now. And she said, well, if I don't do that, I'll burst into tears. And I said, that's okay, that's okay. And she burst into tears and we cried together and it was nice. And, uh, and our relationship deepened and uh, we're still very close. I just saw her two nights ago. Um, and, we're, and we talk about Ruby and Hart and sometimes we cry, but, um, but it's okay, you know, it's okay. Um, and so it was just helpful to be blunt uh, and direct with my community. And what was so great was I got immediate positive feedback. So everybody that I told my grief spiel to, everybody was was grateful. And then also it changed their behaviors. And so I was like, oh, this is really effective. It was a like positive reinforcement. So it really helped me in talking to my friends. And uh, And the next sort of thing that I discovered is the power of emails. And so I, I found that uh, for example, I had a friend who was again another a dear, dear friend. She loved Ruby and Hart. Her, her son was a close friend of Hart's. She was so supportive. I was in grief, so loving and caring and supportive. But she had an annoying habit of of narrating our grief. So she would come to our house and full of sympathy and love, and then she would sort of tell us how she imagined we felt. And again, it's, it's, it's from a positive place, right? She's trying to connect to us. She's trying to, I think, show us how deeply she's thinking about us, that she can actually imagine how we're doing. But the problem was that she was, she's a very articulate person. Uh, and so she would paint these very deep, beautiful pictures of our pain. And it was upsetting to Gail and I. And we didn't really have, at first, the right words for it. Our first reactions were like, um, our first reactions were, we can't talk to her ever again because we can't stand this. And, and, and what can we say to her? And then we thought about it for a little bit and we're like, no, no, we love her. She loves us. She loves our children. What can we say to her? And so we crafted an email. We sat and really thought about it and said, you know, I'm not going to say her name, but dear, dear friend, <laughs> um, uh, we want to take a walk with you later on today. Uh, and we want to talk about this thing that's that's troubling us. And and we were very explicit in our in our email, trying to explain what it was that that, that she was narrating our pain that felt hurtful to us. Uh, and we look forward to taking a walk with you later on today and talking about it in person. And right away she emailed back. And this is all in my book, by the way. I wrote a book about grief and grieving called uh, Finding the Words: Working Through Profound Loss with Hope and Purpose. Uh, and it came out in March. <clears throat> and um, and in the book, I write about how she immediately emailed us back and said, thank you. Thank you for telling me this. And she said, you know, I tear up every time I think about this beautiful email she sent us. She said, I've never walked with another person through this kind of a loss. And it's so meaningful to me that you have taken the time and effort to explain to me what I'm doing wrong, because I'm certain to fall on my face many times. Um, so thank you. And let's talk on the walk. And on the walk, she and I were talking, and she pointed out another observation, which is she said, I know how difficult that must have been for you to send that email. And it means so much to me that our friendship mattered enough for you to take the time and effort to do that, which I thought was such a beautiful response. Um, and again, uh, it was sort of positive reinforcements of this idea of communicating our grief needs to our community. Um, and she remains a very close friend, uh, and we see her all the time, and uh, we have a great relationship. Um, but it was in danger. It was in real danger in early grief. We, we never wanted to see her again. <laughs> um, and, and I want to acknowledge that it's so hard to do what I'm saying, by the way. Um, it's so hard, and it sort of breaks a lot of social norms to tell people how to talk to you, right? You don't talk to your friends like this normally. 
it's bizarre. But I felt at the time that I didn't have anything to lose because I, I had learned from Shiva how important it was to me to have these meaningful conversations. and I desperately needed them. And so I'm like, well, if you're offended and I lose friends, I'm going to lose you anyway because I've lost you because you're not talking to me, my grief. So I, I, I felt like the stakes were so high and I was in so much pain and discomfort that the, the social nicety of telling, you know, breaking the social nicety of telling people how to interact with me, it wasn't so difficult for me. Um, but, uh, but it was hard. I mean, it wasn't difficult in the sense that I, I, it was worth it to me, but it is hard. It is hard to sit down and, and write or tell someone to their face, you know, your grief needs. And I think what also helped me in doing that is the fact that I was so bad at it before I lost Ruby and Hart. So I was definitely a bad friend to people in grief. I was one of those people who backed away, who didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything. Um, I was very uneasy with grief. And so I have a lot of, I continue to have a lot of empathy for people who quote unquote get it wrong, you know, who, um, who, who say the wrong thing to me or who don't know or fumble um, because I, I, w- I was that person 100%. So I, I think that helped me have compassion for people um, and, and was able, I'm able to you know, let go of any sort of residual anger for the most part <laughs> if people say sort of quote unquote hurtful things to me. Um, and a- another thing that I wanna share um, is the idea of, of rituals, rituals as a way of also keeping your community. So again, this is from the Jewish traditions. So the first week is the week of Shiva, and then Shiva ends, and there's no more rituals till the end of Shloshim. So Shloshim is the first 30 days after the funeral, and you're supposed to mark it with some kind of a ceremony. And what's interesting is the Jewish tradition doesn't tell you what that ceremony should be. There's no guideline, just says mark it with a ceremony. And in a way, I found that was like an incredible gift because Gail and I had to think about what would be a meaningful ceremony for us that would honor Ruby and Hart and our grief and and what what we want and need in this moment. And it was it was a gift in two ways. One, it organized our days. So after Shiva ended, we were adrift. You know, we had no structure to our days again. We're we're in acute grief, um, and, and we're struggling with you know learning how to do the grief spiel and talk to people. But but our days are kind of uh, 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 emptiness for us. But now suddenly we had a goal, we had a, a purpose, we had to organize a ritual for the for the end of the 30th day. So it organized our days, gave us some structure, which was very helpful. And we came up with a, with a ceremony, we, we dedicated two beautiful trees um, at the Los Angeles Arboretum. And it's a, a beautiful park about uh, 40 minutes east of Los Angeles, uh, in Arcadia. And we went there as a family many, many times. All four of us loved it. So we have many happy, silly, goofy memories of Ruby and Hart and Gail and I in in, um, the park. And so we found these two trees, they're Engelman Oaks, and their branches are intertwined. So it looks as if they're, they're hugging. It's kind of a spectacular set of two trees. And we dedicated them to Ruby and Hart. We have plaques on them. And they, the, the park was, the Arboretum was kind enough to sort of speed up the process. We'd get those plaques in time for our ceremony. And then we invited a bunch of close friends to come along with our rabbi. And we gathered in this kind of remote spot in the park where the trees are. And we held hands. Uh, we put our hands on each other's shoulders. Uh, we listened to the air. We touched the trees. We told stories about Ruby and Hart, funny stories, sad stories. Um, we shared a word. Everyone shared one word thinking about Ruby and Hart, and it was a very meaningful gathering, and it was hard. It was a hard gathering. Uh, I don't want to sugarcoat anything in grief. <laughs> it was very painful, and at one point, Gail, in fact, said to the crowd, she said, you know, this is a beautiful place we're gathered, but I kind of want to take you all to the crash site. I want to bring you all to the twisted steel and the, and the smoke and the burning engine uh, and the highway and, and the broken glass, and it's that feeling of like, it's so hard um, and there's so much rage and pain and uh, in a way it almost felt like this is such a, this is too pretty, this gathering. But, um, but after it ended, we both felt like 
it helped us. It helped us and it helped us keep our community. And so we started thinking along the lines of whenever we feel lonely, whenever we feel like we have a holiday we have to deal with that's difficult, we can just have a ceremony. We can have a gathering of people. It doesn't have to be a big gathering. It could be a small gathering, but some way, some ritual that's going to help us through the darkest days. Um, and that has been true. Um, and now it's, it's uh, four and a half years since the crash, and we've held many ceremonies and gatherings. Uh, and they've helped us through the hardest of times. And again, that was a gift from the Jewish traditions of, of, of mourning. Um, and what one of the one of the first big gatherings we had after that was for my birthday. I just want to talk about it briefly. Um, every year I used to have a birthday celebration uh, where I'd gather at the beach and I'd invite my friends and Ruby's friends and Hart's friends and Gail's friends and I'd buy everybody sandwiches. That was, that was the deal. You had to email me your sandwich requests, very specific, and I would get that sandwich uh, um, and bring it to the beach and we'd all gather and we'd play beach volleyball or, or dodgeball uh, or bingo and we jump in the ocean and it was a beautiful day and all four of us loved it. It was a very meaningful day for all of us as a family. Um, and now suddenly it's September, it's in September and the crash was in June. And so uh, the end of Shloshim was in July. So now it's just two months after that. And I'm thinking I'm turning 50 and I'm thinking, I, I don't, how can I celebrate my birthday? How can I celebrate anything? Um, I, I, I feel like my life has been destroyed. I feel like the first 50 years of my life have been rendered meaningless because my children were killed and now my future feels meaningless. And so how am I going to get through this, this awful day that's supposed to be a celebration? And, and I decided to turn into a memorial for Ruby and Hart. And at first people were like, uh, they're like, that's a good idea, Colin, but let's take it easy and maybe somebody else will get the sandwiches and and we'll have a, an exit strategy for you so you can leave the party anytime you like and duck out and go to somebody else's house. And 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 at first I thought that's, that's a great idea. And it is wise in early grief to have exit strategies. But I thought like, no, I want to get those sandwiches. I want to do it the way I've always done it. I want to have continuity. I want to have my beach gathering, but it's going to be a memorial now, but I'm going to get everybody sandwiches the same way as I did before. And the, literally twice as many people came as they ever came to my birthday celebrations. And it was a huge gathering of people. And we, uh, we spelled out Ruby and Hart's names in rocks. This is a friend of mine. I, I asked him, you know, I don't want to have some kind of a, a ritual at this gathering. And he suggested spelling their names in rocks. I thought that was a beautiful idea. And I told everybody to bring a rock. And we all gathered and there were like 140 people and they all had rocks. <laughs> and I said, we're going to spell out Ruby and Hart's names. And it was a kind of a magical moment because somebody said, well, tell us how big each letter should be, Colin. And I was like, well, first of all, I don't know. <laughs> right. But second of all, I didn't want to, con I'm a very controlling person. I'm a director um, and directors can have a lot of opinions about things. And I, and I, my first instinct was I'm going to direct this. It's about my children. But then I suddenly realized it would be so much more meaningful if I didn't, if I just said, you guys figure it out, just put the rocks down and, and spell it out. Um, and it, it, it really empowered everybody in a beautiful way. Nobody was in charge. Everyone just put their rocks down and it, they spelled out Ruby and heart perfectly. And all the rocks got used and every letter was the perfect size. <laughs> the last letter was the end of hearts T and it was spectacular um, and painful. And then we all shouted out loud, Ruby and Heart, and we ran to the ocean and just swam out past the breakers. And, um, and, and then the rocks eventually got washed away uh, because they're on the beach. And that, that felt meaningful as well. Um, and so every year now I, have a, uh, I don't have a birthday party, I have a beach memorial for Ruby and Heart. And that's how I get through my birthday. Um, because I can't really imagine getting through it any other way. Um, and it's so beautiful that I'm able to assemble my community and that they show up for me in my grief. Um, and I, uh, I want to tell another story about, um, reaching out to our friends 
uh, and, and sort of being blunt and direct. Um, and it's about New Year's Eve. So every year we would have a big New Year's Eve party. Uh, we were a party house, in case you didn't notice. Um, we loved a good party, all of us. And our New Year's Eve parties, I thought, were pretty spectacular because they were an all-ages party. So there were, there were always lots of kids and adults. And we have a, a backyard pool, and I would, and I would hire a, uh, a lifeguard and heat the pool up really hot in the winter. Um, it's Los Angeles, but still, it's cold, <laughs> December 31st. And uh, so we had a lifeguard, so it was safe. And kids would show up in their bathing suits. So we'd have kids splashing in the pool, adults drinking and, and schmoozing upstairs, and then kids running through the house wet with bathing suits and towels. It was like chaos. And then I always had these poppers that would explode uh, confetti all over the house. So it was, we made an amazing mess basically every night, every, every year. And, and we'd been having these parties for 10, 12 years. And the first, well, the second, like the first Christmas, the first New Year's Eve, we, we actually weren't in the country. We, we, we left the country because we couldn't handle it. But the second year, we're in America, and all these people who came to our house year after year must have been thinking about us, right, on New Year's Eve. <laughs> um, and, and it was so painful because nobody was reaching out. And we were thinking, like, oh, my God. How can these people not be reaching out to us? They know we're at home alone on New Year's Eve and no one's inviting us to anything. Uh, and they all came to our house for so many years. What's going on? And we were in a grief group uh, at the time and someone in a grief group said, well, you could reach out to people and ask them for a memory, which is kind of great because that's sort of exactly my advice would be, <laughs> right? That's what I'm telling people to do. Reach out and tell people your grief needs. But, but I was so angry. I couldn't even think to do it. Uh, and so then we we're like, oh, that's a great idea. Thank you. And we reached out to all of our friends. We sent an email and said, look, this is really hard for us. And could you please do us a favor on New Year's Eve and send us a memory of Ruby and Hart? Uh, and they did. People sent their memories in. And that helped us get through that holiday. Um, so uh, so it's, it's never easy, I guess, you know, keeping your community. Um, but I found that it's so helpful. Um, it's so helpful to me. Um, and I'll, I'll give one more example because I have some time still. Um, uh, shortly after the kids were killed, there was a, a pandemic, a global pandemic, which I'm sure you all remember. And there was lockdown, uh, starting in March. And after the crash, it was just a few months after the crash, we're in lockdown. And a group of friends did uh, a Friday night cocktail Zoom, which I'm sure, again, many of you may remember as well. People would gather on Zoom and have cocktails and chit chat. And they invited Gail and I. And Gail wasn't up for it, but I joined in. And so we're on Zoom. And these are all people who were friends because our children were friends. So these are all people that we met because uh, their kids were friends with Ruby and Hart through elementary school. And that's why we know each other. And we're there on Zoom and we're chit-chatting and talking for about a full hour and nobody mentions Ruby or Hart or my grief. And I hang up this, the, the Zoom call and I tell Gail this, nobody mentioned Ruby and Hart. Um, and I would mention them occasionally, but then that was it. I would say their names, but nobody would do a follow-up call or anything, a follow-up question. And I felt like, oh my God. And Gail and I were just furious. Like, what's happening? Our kids were killed just a few months ago and no one's even mentioning them. That's why we're friends. It's because of our kids. This is insane. Let's never talk to them again. <laughs> we were so full of rage. And then we thought about it for a while and, and, and wisdom prevailed. And it's like, no, they didn't talk about Ruby and Hart because they were scared. And they'd all heard my grief spiel many times. <laughs> they'd come to the house. They'd come to the beach memorial. They knew that we needed to talk about Ruby and Hart, but when a push came to shove, they just didn't have the strength, courage, confidence to say Ruby and Hart or to ask me, how am I doing in grief uh, during this pandemic where everybody's locked up with their families and we don't have our family. Uh, it was a particularly brutal time for us. Um, and so we sat down and wrote a careful email 
Uh, and again, it, we didn't, I, my first instinct, of course, is to like rail at them. How dare you do this to me, <laughs> right? But then it's like, wait, 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 wait. Can I send an email full of love? Can I do it lovingly? Because I desperately want them in my life. They love Ruby and Hart. Uh, I don't want to lose anybody who loves Ruby and Hart. I want to keep everybody. <laughs> if they love my children, I want to still have them in my life. And so I had to really sit down and temper my thoughts and send an email full of love, but also saying, hey, look, it hurt. It hurt me. It hurt me to not talk about Ruby and Hart. Um, and could you please, in the future, ask me in the first five minutes about Ruby and Hart? We don't have to talk about Ruby and Hart the whole time. Right, it's been it's been six months now. I, I'm I'm more stable. I'm not in acute acute grief now, but I do need to talk about them a little bit. <laughs> Otherwise, I just can't handle it. And so I, I crafted this email. It's in the book. I put the email in the book, um, and uh, and I got amazing responses back. Uh, all these friends, they said, "Oh my God, I, I was just too scared." And of course, of course, I, we will talk about Ruby and Hart. I promise. And thank you for telling me this. And there were beautiful responses. Um, so it's never easy, but uh, I find that uh, it always, for me at least, it's always paid off. Um, I know some people, some people struggle because that's what I hear in grief groups. That's really one of the reasons why I wrote my book was I would sit in grief circles uh, and compassionate friends, for example, in our house and mad. So I sat, I sat in a number of grief circles um, and the pattern was always the same. People would start with the, the grief, the aching, the pain, the, the despair at their loss. And then it would shift very quickly into complaining about how they were abandoned by their loved ones, how they felt so alone and so confused. Why aren't people reaching out to us? I don't understand. Uh, so betrayed, so angry. And I felt like I could feel myself drifting there as well. And I don't want that. I don't want to be that person who is just has that, that um, suffering on top of my grief, right? So we've got the pain of grief, but, but can we avoid the pain of abandonment? You know, what can we do to take positive steps? Um, and that really is what inspired me to write my book. Uh, and I know, I know of people who, you know, Again, I don't want to paint a rosy picture. There are people out there, you reach out, you tell them what you need, and they just do not deliver. <laughs> they just, they're toxic, or they just can't learn. They can't do it. Um, and, and that's when you have to ask yourself, well, you know, maybe, maybe I have to let this person go because they're, they're not actually helping me in my grief. But I feel like um, we owe it to ourselves to try as hard as we can um, to get through to the people and, and ed educate them because we as a society don't know how to talk to the grieving. We don't know how to treat the grieving um, well. And, and so often the default is to abandon them. So I actually wrote a, an essay in the, uh, in the Atlantic. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this essay, but uh, it made its rounds with the idea being that um, a, a lot of what people said to me in early grief was there are no words. They would say it over and over again. It was kind of insane how often it was said to me, <laughs> uh, hundreds of times. It was like a catchphrase that everybody knew. Like, I don't know how everyone knew to say this, but they all did. Almost everybody said it to me. And at first I was like, yeah, there are no words. You're right. It's just so terrible. But after you hear that for the hundredth time, you start thinking, well, maybe there are words. <laughs> like, who says there are no words? Uh, and, and I really rebelled against that because so often that would be a conversation stopper. They'd come in, they'd say, there are no words. And then we just sit there in silence. And I still desperately needed to talk about Ruby and Hart and about my grief. I wanted words because I, I had to process my loss. It was so catastrophic. I couldn't just sit there in silence. That wasn't actually helpful. And so I began this sort of campaign against there are no words. Because um, I want us as a society to do better. Uh, and we're not looking for the, the perfect words, right? We're not looking for the words that are going to fix anything. They're going to solve my problem or take away my pain. Not at all. There are no words that are going to do that. But just to allow us to talk about grief and grieving, it's so helpful. Um, and I think really it's necessary. I think that that's in a way how we grieve. That's literally how we process our loss is by talking about it. And it kind of makes sense because that's how we process anything. 
So if we go and see a, like a funny movie, we want to talk about it with our friends. And they'll ask like, well, why was it so funny? And then you tell them why it's funny. And that's sort of how you understand and learn and process why it was funny to you because you have to talk about it to somebody else. <laughs> And we do that with everything in our lives, except grief, it feels like to me. We talk about all of our problems and all of our joys, but grief somehow is like this taboo that we can't talk about. It's too big, it's too big to talk about. Um, and and I, I think that's not true. I think that uh, that we can all find, it doesn't have to be great words, but we can find, find any words at all <laughs> are better than no words. Um, and then uh, one more, uh, concept I want to share from my book. Um, <clears throat> it's a sort of central idea that, that I encountered, which was, I call it leaning into the pain. Um, and uh, very early on, I had this epiphany in my grief. I had these pictures of Ruby and Hart, uh, these, these like three by two foot photographs of them from the, the funeral. So a friend of ours took these four photographs and blew them up, two of Ruby, two of Hart, and afterwards I took them home and I put them on my living room walls because I liked seeing their big, beautiful faces smiling at me. And then I in fact asked for four more. So I had eight of these giant pictures of Ruby and Hart in our living room and we could look at them. And it was like, oh, they're, they're still here somehow, right? In, in this space. It was like a giant um, ofrenda or like mausoleum in a way, right? And so one morning I came down the stairs and I looked up at the photos and I, I just had to look away because it was too painful. It hurt me to look at them. And in that moment, I caught myself. I was like, what am I doing? I'm looking away from my own children because I'm scared of the pain. And I, I don't want to ever do that. I don't ever want to look away from my children. And I, I shouted out to them, the photographs, like I, I was crying, I was in tears. And I shouted out, I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of you. And for me, it was like, I, I'm not going to let fear of the pain keep me from the memories of my children or keep me from connecting with my children. And I've, I've tried to live by that um, because, let's face it, there's so much pain, uh, you know, looking at their photographs, looking at videos of, their, of them, uh, going to our favorite restaurants, doing our favorite walks. Uh, looking at their favorite spots in, in the house, like that we as grievers are confronted, overwhelmed with memories and painful thoughts every day, right? Um, and we, every day we have this, this choice to make of, do we, do we block it out? Do we just say like, I, I'm, I'm not strong enough right now. I'm going to look away. Um, and sometimes we all do, right? But I found that it, if I can think about it and say, I, I don't want to look away, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to look at the photos, even though it hurts right now and it's early in the morning. And I, you know, I haven't had my, my tea yet, but someone sent me a photograph. This is what happens, right? Someone says, oh, I, it's beautiful. I was thinking of you and here's a photo I found of Ruby and they send it, you know, they text it to me. So it pops up my phone at 8.30 in the morning. Bam, my beautiful daughter smiling back at me and she's gone and oh my God, <laughs> right? And I try to always look at the photo. I try to lean into that pain, not because I'm a masochist, I'm not trying to feel the pain, but I'm trying to not let the pain stop me from feeling the good thoughts, feeling the, feeling the good memories. Um, and again, I don't wanna sugarcoat it and make it seem like it's easy. Um, it's not, um, and I don't always succeed. <laughs> um, but I, it helps me to have that sort of objective of like, yes, I'd like to be engaged with the grief. I'd like to allow myself to feel the pain because that's how I'm going to have access to the memories of Ruby and Hart. Um, and that's, that's, been a, that's been a guiding light for me in my grief as I grieve.